Welcome to Sober Math. We've all seen this monument before, right? The Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri. The essential mathematical curve of this arch is called the catenary in the UK and the catenary in the US, which is an hyperbolic cosine. And here's the formula. Today I will assume familiarity with a little trigonometry, sums, and vector addition. This arch is the same curve formed by suspended cables and chains. But how do we know? We model the cable as a curve of constant mass density and integrate along the curve so the tension is always tangential to it. See the discussion in books on vector mechanics. What I would like to show you today is an alternative derivation of this curve. Oh wait, what? Cylinders resting on top of cylinders to, to form an arch? Yep, you got it. That would be completely unstable. Unless the arch is reinforced, it is bound to collapse by a slipping or rolling motion. So what I'm proposing is not to actually build a usable structure this way, but as a method to visualize the forces by geometric intuition, and in so doing, to build intuition for doing sums and integrals. So let's do this. To keep it simple, let's imagine identical uniform cylinders, which are deep enough, so no worries about the arch tipping over. Consider this blue cylinder. Its weight points straight down as depicted by this blue vector which acts on the center. The blue cylinder feels the pressure from everything above it as depicted by this red vector which points down to the center of the blue because of the nice geometry. And we can slide a vector along its line of action to get the same effect. And now the green cylinder isn't too happy about all that pressure from above and so it pushes back with an equal and opposite total force and we slide this green vector to the center. So the blue cylinder now feels three forces, and they all cancel perfectly. To see this, we move the three vectors and keep their directions the same, and when placed tip to tail, they form a closed path, so that it's a triangle. And that means the total or net force acting on the blue cylinder is zero. Otherwise, it would move, right? Actually, technically, by Newton's second law, it would accelerate. So for a static arch, a similar condition is true for all the cylinders. Next, we focus on the forces of the green cylinder. We can reverse the direction of the green reaction vector we just saw, color it blue, and now this is the force that the green cylinder feels by the blue one pushing on it. And then we repeat what we did earlier. In this way, we can figure all the vectors and where to position the cylinders in the first place so that the arrows will always pass through the centers. And that's what we'll do today. So let's choose our notation and set up our coordinates. This capstone cylinder at the apex looks pretty important, right? So let's define its center to be the origin of our xy coordinate system. And I'll break with convention and define the vertical scale as being positive downward. And I call this apex cylinder, cylinder zero. And the next pair of cylinders downward, we can call cylinders 1, and so on. And so all cylinders will have a common radius r. So check out this position vector from the origin to the center of cylinder 1. Its length is twice the radius, so it's 2r. And let's call this angle theta. And these two numbers are constants. So once you pick a value for r and a value for theta, you've effectively specified the shape that the arch will take. The location of the center of cylinder 1 is at coordinates 2r cosine theta, comma, 2r sine theta. The arch has bilateral symmetry everywhere so that the figure reflects about the y-axis. And the opposing cylinder 1 has a center located at negative 2r cosine theta, comma, 2r sine theta. For cylinder 0, we introduce the common weight vector w, which points straight down for all the cylinders, but for now, I'll only show it for cylinder zero. Consider this tangent plane of contact between the two touching cylinders zero and one to the right. The net force of cylinder zero onto cylinder one passes through the point of contact and is perpendicular to that plane. And notice that because of the symmetry of the circle, the line of action of the force passes through the centers of both cylinders. The force of cylinder zero onto one is a component of W. We visualize the component in the orange dashed line, 
by the lateral symmetry, there must be a component of w on the left. But you've probably spotted the problem, right? In my haste to draw the components, I didn't scale them properly. So we vector add the orange components to get the yellow weight vector. And that's better. We rescaled the component of w, so they have just the right length so that we can do this tip to tail vector addition. This orange vector from cylinder 0 to 1 we shall call F0. Notice that the vertical Y component of F0 is half of W by the symmetry in the tip to tail vector diagram. And so we can write this equation. But then because of angle theta, the tangent of theta is the Y component of F0 divided by its X component. And it follows that the X component of F0 is half W times cotangent theta. And we can stow away these results. And now we can build formulas for compounding static forces. So let F0 slide through its line of action and attach the vector W to cylinder 1. We can visualize vector addition as forming a parallelogram with the resultant W plus F0 passing between opposite corners. And so we can now place the cylinder 2 with its center lying on this vector to maintain unstable equilibrium. The yellow force vector F1 is the force from cylinder 1 to 2. And its equation is written as, and now we repeat the process. We slide F1, and then we draw weight W onto cylinder 2, and draw a green resultant, which is 2W plus F0. Again, we place cylinder 3 in its path, and this is the force of cylinder 2 onto 3, called F2, and has this equation. And these generalize to the force of the nth cylinder onto the n plus 1th cylinder. And now we put this in a green box and put it aside. Notice that vector nw is only in the vertical direction. So the horizontal component of fn doesn't change as we increase n. So the x component of fn is just the original x component of f0. Then this equates to w over 2 times cotangent theta. The y component of our vector equation is this. And plug in the y component of f0, and now factor. Consider the Pythagorean theorem as it applies to our nth force. And plug in our contributions. Take the square root and take the positive solution, since the magnitude of any force is always positive. And now stow away our force and its components. Let x0 be the horizontal coordinate of the center of cylinder 0. We let x1 be the horizontal coordinate of the center of cylinder 1, and so on. And let the delta x's be defined this way, as backward differencing. By the telescoping property, sums of differences cancel in pairs. So we are left with xn minus x0 equals the sum over all the lower delta x's up to that point. And because x0 is at the origin, x0 equals 0, and this simplifies. A similar argument holds for the vertical quantities. For all our red triangles, there is a common hypotenuse 2r. Remember from geometry that congruent parts of similar triangles are proportional. We can compare this particular red triangle with the corresponding right triangle formed by the force 1 and its x component and then we get this proportionality relationship. And it's easy to show that it generalizes to this. And by similar reasoning, it's easy to see there's a corresponding relationship for y. And now we move the delta x formula in place. Plugging in the force fnx and fn, we get this. And the half w's cancel, but we're left with delta x of n plus 1 but it's incompatible with delta x sub j in the blue box. So a temporary change of index. Let n prime equal n plus 1. Written this way, the delta x formula is, which simplifies to this. And now we just relabel the dummy index n prime as j and plug this into the summation to get this. And now we move things around a bit and we do the same thing with y. 
We plug in the forces, then cancel the half Ws, and then do the same index relabeling to get the summation formula for Y, and then move it to the top. These two sums will give the centers of all the cylinders for our arch extending down to infinity. Again, its only parameters are the common radius R and the angle of declination theta of cylinder 0 over cylinder 1. It is convenient to introduce the large number quantity capital N, which is the cotangent of theta. This number is large for small angle theta, which for our arch forms a continuous limit. So subbing in, we get and now consider a change to index k equals 2j minus 1, which will simplify the form of the summand. Written in terms of this new index, our 2x and y sums are, which changes the upper and lower limits of the sums accordingly. And that's much nicer. And now we take the continuous limit and write our sums as definite integrals. For brevity, I'll gloss over the integrations, which has the following forms and is easily verified. We plug in the limits of integration into our antiderivative for x. The limit of cap n goes to infinity as the arc cinch of 1 over n tends to 0, so the second term vanishes in our large n, small angle limit. Now divide by 2rn and take the inverse function. We get that 2n minus 1 is cap n times the cinch of xn over 2rn. This will come in handy in a minute. Can you feel that we are getting close to our catenary curve? And now to focus on the solution for the y integral. It evaluates to this, and the limit as n approaches infinity of the square root of n squared plus 1 tends to n. So we plug this in. And now we plug in our 2n minus 1 formula. It is at this point that the subscript little n loses meaning, and so we drop it from x and y. And then we factor cap n from the square root. And now recall the identity where cosh squared minus cinch squared of an angle equals 1. Taking the square root, we are interested in the positive solution. We get the cosh of an angle is the square root of 1 plus the cinch squared of that angle. And now we substitute the cosh identity in to obtain our result. And now y is in the form of a catenary in the small angle limit for an arch of cylinders. So the constant of this result is 2rn, which is approximately the half length of the arch, which it approaches in the small angle limit. From the finite sums for xn and yn, we can obtain small angle approximations without an integral by using this approximation. 1 plus x to the power p is approximately equal to 1 plus p times x, where x is small. In this limit, we dissolve the negative 1 half power, that is the square root in the denominator of the sums, and stand a chance of evaluating the sums as a combination of Bernoulli sums. And that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.